Good afternoon. I, um, I see the red light is already on, so oh, is that I mean? started to green. Sorry. <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, what I want to do is share a journey with uh, that our company has been through, and hopefully there's some information in here that will help you avoid some of the pain that we had. Um, this is all about how a smart meter and time of use program changed our relationship with customers in ways that we did not anticipate. But a little context first. Who are we? Well, we're a small company. These numbers are quite small compared to the, uh, the companies you're used to. Uh, we supply the capital city of Canada, uh, the city of Ottawa, about a million residents. Um, we are a regulated for-profit company. We happen to be municipally owned. Um, and the province regulates our business. But we are also, this is also good, important for context, we are both a network operator and a supplier. So there is a retail business in, the, in, our, in our jurisdiction, but it's very weak and it's, and it's optional. So thought only about four to five percent of the customers have actually signed up with a retailer. The rest of them go with a default supply. So we are essentially both the retailer and the network operator, which means that we have the complete relationship with those customers, both the billing relationship and the, the delivery relationship. So you can see we have some interesting numbers up there, and I'll get into those a little bit more. For those who have been to Canada, you'll recognize this map. For those of you who haven't, the province of Ontario is the, essentially the largest, uh, has the largest population of about 13 to 14 million. 40% of Canadians live in Ontario, and about um, and about half of those live in the city of Toronto. Um, the thing that's important about this map is that the, there's a lot of space in there, and lot, not very many customers, so there's some interesting, uh, interesting um, challenges, but that the province has jurisdiction over the, in, over the industry, not the federal government. So because the province had jurisdiction, they decided, they decided in 2005 that there was going to be a smart meter program. So that's now eight years ago. Uh, we started on this journey to install smart meters. By the end of 2010, they were all done. We had a few stragglers. We managed to get those replaced uh, just last year. Uh, we elected to go with the Elster, the Elster meter, which is a mesh network meter, which is a fairly important decision, by the way. I'll, I'll reiterate that. The choice of your meter is really important. Now, we didn't get a lot of complaints because I think we were sort of first out of the gate. Uh, unlike places like California and British Columbia, where people are really dead set against meters, smart meters, we managed to get, in, get them installed without a lot of trouble. So what did this mean? Well, we had to retool everything we did on meter to cash. We have a centralized meter data management and repository, which is run by the province. So what that means is our mesh network meters, all that data comes into our, our building. We send it off to the province. They churn it and sanitize it and, and clean, up, clean it up, send it back to us in bill format, and then we issue a bill. It also meant that the thing was, as I said, an order of magnitude more complicated. We had to have enhanced uh, disaster recovery systems. And everybody got time of use rates at the same time. So time of use rates is now fully in place for about 24 or 36 months. And it's a regulated rate, not a real-time rate. It's a regulated uh, uh, en energy rate. And you can see the pricing on the right-hand side. The off-peak pricing is about half, slightly, slightly more than half of the peak pricing. So everybody, there is no more standard, uh, standard offering on pricing. It's all time-of-use rates. So just a bit of background. Where, how did we get here? I mean, if you think about the billing systems, and how we managed meter to cash in the old days, we actually had to throw away a 100-year-old model. For 100 years, our great-grandparents, our grandparents and our parents all experienced the same relationship with their utility. Somebody walked around the neighborhood or drove around, if there were RF meters, took a reading every one or two months, depending on your billing cycle, brought it back to the office, somebody would key it into a system somewhere, and a bill would get mailed to the customer and they would either send a check back or pay for it at the bank. So that model is gone. 
and we've now replaced it with this. So we have our third of a million meters all, all over the city, blanketing the city, every single residence, every single business. About 1,200 collectors on this mesh network, so the meters can talk to each other or to, or sorry, to another, to the collector. They actually bounce from meter to meter and then to the collector. The collector sends the data into our system, and this is where we start to get big data. Um, and then we send it off to the meter data management repository in, the, in, the, in Toronto, and it comes back to us in a billing format, um, at which point we post it on our web portal and our customers access it. So there is, a, there is a, something that's very interesting. I don't have the actual numbers, but I am told that there's more electronic traffic in Ontario for 13 million people from electric utility billing than there is from banking transactions. So I guess you could say the theme of my talk is how to survive big data rather than what to, how to manage it. So that's a, that's a frightening statistic when you think about it. Instead of six data points a year for, per customer, we now have six every six hours. So the other thing we did was we have now, now part of the program is you have to have presentment. The customer has to access the information that's embedded in their meter. So we prepared this, we give, give them a dashboard, a dashboard that they can customize themselves. So they have access the next day to their consumption data, it's not real time yet. They can look at two months back, they can download the data in PDF or Excel format and give it to a third party provider to analyze for them. Um, they can they can customize this chart to compare their bill to uh, previous periods. Um, so, so far, so good. The take up on this has been popular. We've got good penetration. But what we did going through this exercise that we did not anticipate is that we woke everybody up. Not only did our relationship with our customers change, but their relationship with us changed. So this is what we learned on the journey. And a lot of this you've already seen today and yesterday and the day before. So Ottawa is a modern city. It's high penetration of the internet. Most people wander around with a personal internet presence in their pocket. Um, they have instant gratification because of that presence and that device that they carry around with them. And they expect that kind of instant gratification from other providers electric utilities being, some, being one of them. So they're no longer passive and trusting and hardwired. They are now, as I say, interconnected. They have many interests. They're, they're more interested in energy because we told them they had to be with time of use rates. And as a result, not only did we become more aware of them, they became more aware of us. And my personal view is that because of this, this change, trust might be a little more fragile. And what I'm trying to say here is that really what happened was, even though we were ahead of the game on the rollout of time of use rates and all of the devices in the field, we were actually reacting when it came to our customers' reaction to this. When we put out time of use rates, we had a huge community outreaches. We, we went to business associations, we went to politicians, we, we the local weekly community newspapers turned out to be a fantastic vehicle to get the information out. Bill stuffers, not so much. Um, but it, when it came right down to it, we didn't anticipate what they were expecting of us in the future. So we decided, well, let's find out a little bit more. And um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this is we did some focus groups, we did some excuse me, statistical surveys, um, and we, look, we tried to look at the different personas in our, this is an example of our, our residential. I'll talk a bit about one of them, the tech connected. So you can see this is very similar to the, the discussion we had earlier this morning about who are our customers and what are their segments. This is what we have found for our group. Unwilling, strapped, don't care, overwhelmed, open to conversation, comfortable and tech-connected. 
We also have one for commercial customers. So we're, this is early for us. We're just learning. So the tech connected, connected customer, none of this will surprise any of you. They care about technology. They don't want to change their habits. They're most, most likely to be male, young, have kids. They own homes. They, they're early adopters. They have all of, the, all of the electronic devices. They're the ones that line up for the new iPhone. And they like Facebook. Everything is done online. They pay all their bills. They, they want their communications online. They have a reasonable knowledge of, what, of our industry. Um, but and they're a small group, but they have a loud voice. So while all this learning for us is going on, what have we been doing? Well, we woke up, we had an early customer service strategy, and we started implementing things that would maybe le try to leverage our smart meter and time of use uh, rollout in our AMI system. So these are some of the things we've done. And you can see the list. The one that I like to highlight is the one at the bottom. This one turned out to be extremely popular, where you go on to our website, you log on, um, we, have, we now have almost 33% penetration from our customers on their web portal. So you log on, you get your own data, and you can customize your own alerts. And you can do that through your mobile device as well. And what I mean by that is, um, I want, customer A wants a daily email to, to uh, tell me how, how close I am to a threshold of dollars that I want to spend. I want a weekly email predicting my bill based on my consumption in the past few weeks. I'd like to know, please, um, if I'm late or when my payment is due. So you can set these up and have these things come off as often as you want. And that's turned out to be very high take up and that's very popular. We have a remote or a mobile, sorry, a mobile device. Uh, uh, this is HTML5. Uh, this has actually turned out to be popular as well because you can pay your, you, this, this, you can check out outages on this thing and you can also pay your bill through credit card and you get those alerts, obviously. We also started to realize that they're becoming less and less patient with power outages. So we, we expanded our SCADA devices, fault detectors, monitoring our crews with GPS, outage maps. The single biggest leap for us was communicating with customers on outages. So if, you, if there's a power failure somewhere in the city, uh, we will send out a text alert. The press gets it and other people, not customers yet. But what they will get is the ability to look at this map and you can zoom in on this map right to the street it tells you how many customers are out. It gives you the exact geographic location. Uh, tells you what the crew status is, if they're on route or on site, and it tells you what the estimated time of restoration is. It's proven to be hugely popular, and we get a lot of kudos from this. Now, what I'm, I'm not going through a routine here to, to brag about all the stuff we've done, and a lot of you have done all this stuff as well, but what I'm getting to is what this Pandora's box has opened for us and what it means in the future. So here's how this works. If you have an outage, either it's a SCADA event and we know about it or a customer calls in and our OMS figures out where the outage potential is um, and we, we post that to, straight to our control room. We recognize the customer's phone number because it's on file, either a cell phone or a home phone. Uh, they have the option of speaking to an agent. Um, then that goes into the, as I said, the OMS system and the, uh, and the control room and up to the outage map. At the same time, we issue alerts. Uh, we, have, we issue a Twitter, a tweet, sorry. Yeah, you can tell I'm a Luddite. Um, <laughs> We issue that, we issue that plus the uh, plus email alerts and text messaging to talk about which where the outage is that go, most, goes, mostly goes to media, city council and our key accounts and also goes on the, on the web. That's turned out to be very popular as well. Actually, I, I'm gonna digress a bit if I have time. Twitter, 
I, I'm not really a Luddite. I don't use it myself because I find most of it is nonsense. But there, are, there was one thing that really opened my eyes about Twitter uh, in the fall. When Hurricane Sandy came and trashed the Northeast United States, we were the first Canadian utility to cross the border to go in to help. And so our, our communications people issued a tweet about that. And we, don't have, we didn't have that many followers. We just thought, well, let's just do it anyway. But it turns out the American ambassador to Canada, who has 350,000 followers, retweeted it. So with, one, with two steps, we, we, we hit almost half a million people. And I said, that was the day I thought, OK, there is something to this, I think. Something good and maybe not so good. The other thing I wanted to highlight on here, this is, our, this is our hit list for things we want to do in the future. Meter pinging and last gasp is sort of jargon for talking to the individual meter. Last gasp is help, the meter saying help, I've lost voltage or I'm now out of service and sends a signal off to the utility to let us know. I mean, most of you are aware that the utility does not know there's a power outage unless it's a big one or the customer actually calls you and tells you about it. The promise in the smart meter is that the meter will do that for you. And I was all excited when we put the smart meters in. I thought, finally, we're going to get last gasp. And we will be able to offer to all of our customers individual personalized alerts for their household. Your power is out. Crews are on the way or restor whatever the restoration time is, callbacks for, to make sure that they're back on. It's like, it's like the holy grail for utilities. I have been convinced in the last couple of years that that is an elusive goal. It's a lot more complicated than I thought it was, particularly for a mesh network. And it's something that you do not want to go into, or we are not going to go into unless we get it right. Because the danger of missing something or sending out an alert when it's not real, like a false positive, in my view, is, is playing with your customer satisfaction. Your custom, our, it's easier to say we're on our way globally than to send a, uh, send a message to a customer saying your power is out when it isn't, or not to send a message when it is. So what, is, what's, what have the results been so far? Actually, pretty good. You can see some of this stuff is really pretty, pretty impressive. I'm very happy with it. Our call durations for outages is down to, down to 30 seconds. Uh, very, very limited number of block calls, a positive customer feedback about ease of use, uh, outage maps they love. They've signed up for energy, for energy monitoring. That number is up to 32% now from 27. Electronic billing is starting to accelerate. So all good. Call volumes are down. You can see a little, blip, a little blip there when we rolled out time of use rates, but they're consistently going down when the number of customers are going up. Customer satisfaction. These are pretty good numbers. We're very happy with them. Uh, we, were in the, we were in the 70s, the low 70s, 10 years ago. question we have to ask yourself, is this sustainable? Perhaps. I think it's going to require significant effort. I believe it's fragile. And you also have to ask yourself, when does the law of diminishing returns kick in? Is, if, you, if you want to stay in this, in this neighborhood, what does it mean for your future? Frankly, I don't have the answer. I do feel, though, that this is a lot more fragile than it used to be because we woke the beast. First call resolution, we monitor that. It's, it's, pretty, it's in pretty good shape as well in the mid-80s, mid to high 80s. And the number of escalations, that's our lexicon for um, the customer can't get an answer at our call center or with our call center agents, so they have to go to a politician or somebody to get the answer. And that's come down quite a bit. And we've won some awards, which is all very nice, and I won't dwell on those. What I will dwell on, though, is this summary. 
as I said at the beginning, we've, we're charting territory we did not anticipate a few years ago when we went on this journey. One of the things I've learned is that the more you do for your customer, the more you have to do. I believe that customer satisfaction is very fragile and it's more fragile than it used to be. Um, you can't, once you do some of these things, you can't put that particular toothpaste back in the tube. And the landscape of customer offerings that you can make is almost limitless. Once you have access to data, once you have access to devices and more IT, the tendency for your organization is to get really excited and start offering them to customers. Um, my caution is be, go in with your eyes open. There's an implied promise with the smart meter. Your customer, my recommendation is that your customer engagement should be ahead of the installation, not in reaction to it, which is kind of where we went. It worked out okay, but I, if I had my druthers, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done it differently. And the investments you make now in automation, culture, staff competence, uh, all of those things will pay back handsomely and you will not find yourself scrambling. Thank you.